Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Gene Fritz, a culinary educator, curriculum design consultant, and executive chef. Gene has been a passionate and engaged voice in the culinary education field for more than 30 years. He has been a culinary instructor at Colorado State University, Washington State University, and was the director of culinary operations at Johnson and Wales University. His vast experience also includes working in fine dining restaurants, cooking in the US Army, and winning and judging numerous culinary competitions. More recently, Gene has transitioned his career back to the classroom, and he has enjoyed serving as a high school culinary arts and hospitality management teacher, focusing on developing life skills and professional career paths for young culinarians. Join us today as we chat with Gene about his wide spanning career as a teacher and a chef, designing curriculum, vocational schools, and the future of culinary education. Gene, welcome, buddy. Woo! From, from Battleground High School in the great state of Washington. Yeah, baby. Thank you so much for joining, buddy. How are you? Good. I'm doing, I'm doing awesome. You know, you can see behind me, I've got the, the screen of the lobby of our school, of Battleground High School. Um, go so, Tigers. Uh, huh? <laughs> go Tigers. Go Tigers. Yeah, go Tigers. Um, and, uh, and the students show up tomorrow. So we scheduled this here uh, right at the beginning of the school year. I'm excited because uh, we'll get this thing launched and, and some of my students will be able to, to watch it in week one or week two of the class. So I'm excited about sharing this opportunity and about getting back to school. That's all. I'm exhausted. I'm still exhausted introducing you. I mean, what, <laughs> what haven't you done in our industry? I mean, seriously, th- you know, first and foremost, a big, big thank you. So much going on in the world today. And uh, thank you for your service, you know, many moons ago. Um, greatly appreciated, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Th- and thanks to the people who are serving now, you know, and, and um, yeah, grateful for them being on the wall for us to, to do things like this, you know, so um, thanks, Kurt. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. And so, so let's talk about that for a minute. You cooked in the army, right? How, how did that come about? Was, was cooking a passion of yours before you joined uh, the military? Yeah. So 94 Bravo shout out. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's what it was back then in the army. Uh, you know, it was sort of, I remember I sit down and talk with my dad and he said, uh, you know, you got, you got Burger King on one hand as a career trajectory, or you got the military. And and so I, I was, I loved my Burger King days and um, that, you know, I started off working in the industry when I was in high school. That's one of the reasons why I enjoy so much being back in high school, but uh, the military and the GI Bill um, in particular were, were instrumental. And, and then using that GI Bill to go to the Culinary Institute of America down the road um, after I got out was critical. But yeah, knowing that I wanted to cook, wanted to build some basic skills and, you um, and granted, you know, my time in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, it was varying levels of food preparation. Every once in a while, we get A's and do fresh food for holidays. Um, a lot of the time, it was MREs and and um, and little Chef Boy RD little packet things. And um, you know, we we adapted, and um, it was it was a life changing experience. Uh, being stationed, you know, I'd always encourage students that are thinking about, hey, I don't have a pathway to education. How can I afford that? Uh, the GI Bill is a great uh, way to do that. And, and it's a great way to build uh, a skill set that's sustainable. And, uh, and that's what I did. Yeah. Great, ex- great experiences or examples of experiences that served you well then in the industry once you were cooking, you know, in the actual restaurant yeah. industry? Yeah. You know, probably more wrong experiences than right. But, you know, sometimes we learn from. Okay. Yeah. From mistakes, yeah. Right? yeah well so, said. um, yeah. 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 So it was, you know, but I remember the Sergeant Major coming in and giving me a battalion coin for my pot roast. You know, he gave dinner <laughs> and, and, um, and, and just came back to the kitchen and said, who made the pot roast? And, and I got this coin because he just, and it was, you know, back then, I think you're, you're cooking for three to 400 people every meal. Um, it's, you know, garrison, large quantity production. It's a whole different scale. Um, you're not being very creative. Um, but I remember times trying to flex my muscles. I remember rolling out pie dough in a mobile kitchen trailer with two feet of snow outside in Bielflick in Germany. And so there were times that it was appreciated to be creative, but sometimes 
I think um, food, just like in life in general, um, in the military, food is so important because it's morale, you know, and, yeah, and when, you, yeah. when you have a hot meal, um, it, it just takes you back to home and it's comforting and, um, and it's sustenance that, that the soldiers need. Um, you know, those are, those are sort of the hallmark, those underpinnings that I had as an experience that made me appreciate um, cooking for other people. And even though I knew I wanted to go into culinary school and I was going to get in and sort of get out, um, yeah, it's, it's food is transforming. And I even learned that in, in the army. Yeah. And, and, it, and it brings back the familiar to, to, to many people. It doesn't have to be fancy, yeah. but if it's good, that's a plus. And if it triggers some memories, that's also a plus, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great. So you're, you're, uh, you're in battleground, uh, high school, you're, you're, uh, You've traveled all around the world um, with the military and with with work, right? Culinary school on the East Coast. Um, is is Washington home, or was that home growing up? Yeah, so I've I've always born in Miami, um, uh, but I've always I guess I didn't here. know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Born in Miami, and then when I was eight, my my dad loved the, the Pacific Northwest, and so um, wanted to get out where it was green. And, um, yeah. and so we came out when I was young, uh, I consider myself to be a Washingtonian. Yeah. Grew up in Bellevue, Washington. Um, you know, went, as you mentioned, went to WSU, go Cougs and whoa, and, whoa, wait, and, wait, I wasn't <laughs> ready for that. Go Cougs. Kirk got an Oregon duck duck here. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, I, I love our rivalry. with the it, ducks oh, and the Cougs, yeah. oh, it's been going on for years. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and so, yeah, I went, came back after CIA and went to school here because this is where my roots were, where my family is. And my dad, even just uh, just this summer, relocated. They're in retirement, but relocated to Vancouver. So I'm in the other Vancouver, right? I'm in the Vancouver, Washington, just north of Portland and um, love it here. Yeah. in this summer, this summer has been rocking with the heat. So I feel like I'm in California with blue skies. Um, but we're in the great Pacific Northwest with a, a great landscape, Mount Hood in the backdrop, Columbia River. Um, man, working with food here is something else. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's it's the best. Yeah. As you know, my my oldest daughter and her husband, Sam, are building a house not not far down the road uh, right, from you in that beautiful part of the country. So yeah. so talk about, um, you know, just food in the Northwest, right? You just you mentioned it a couple of times. You've got the You've got the coast, you've got the sort of arid towards the east, just like in Oregon, right? Yeah. yeah. Is, is, it, is it a bounty? Is it, is it all as it is advertised? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the going out and, and finding the, the mush foraging for the mushrooms, um, you know, watching, watching people like Brian Williams go out and catch a fish in, in the-, in the Lots Pacific. of fish. <laughs> yeah, right? And, and, and being able to, I just had a, a buddy that was in Alaska and- he brought halibut back and it was some of the best halibut that I've had. And so knowing that we've got the salmon, you know, we've got the run on the Columbia, we've got um, the Native American influence here, which I always love going back and working with indigenous ingredients like huckleberries, things that are still um, predominant here, maybe hard to access, but still available, um, you know, going out and, and foraging those and cooking with what's um, what is, like you said, the bounty here. I love um, going to the local farmer's market. I mean, going to Pike Place Market, right? Who, if you've been to Seattle, you've been to Pike Place and walking through and, and seeing them throw the salmon and seeing the Dungeness crab and, and the, the uh, abundance of uh, produce um, that's grown, you know, year around here. It is, it is um, it's something to, to be proud of, absolutely. Yeah, you know, as as I as I listen to you, I think back on the years. You know, I spent uh, a piece of my career uh, and college up in the beautiful Northwest. But yeah. um, as I hear you talking, I think about Fernando Divina, Greg Higgins. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Oh my God, Leaf Benson. Um, yeah. From yep. from from Timberline, right? Yep. Was those those folks were doing cool things with local foods. Yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. Right? Corey Schreiber, you know, Corey, and, Corey, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. The icons, you know, when sustainability was new, but it's not new. Right. But it was new to us, you know, our generation of chefs, wait a minute, working with local seasonal, regional farmers, what, you know, um, minimizing the carbon footprint, all that seemed new when I, you know, came out of the industry and came into culinary education 
but it wasn't. It was just going back to the basics again. But you're right; they were pioneers in in the Pacific Northwest. I, I don't know if I ever told you the story. So I went to I went to college, University of Oregon, with Bruce Carey. And Bruce Carey, as you you probably recognize the name, big restaurant tour in the Portland area. One of his first restaurants when he relocated from San Francisco was called Zephyro, and it was up on I want to say 23rd, maybe 21st oh, yeah, or 23rd. 23rd. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. And I'll never forget, I was working at the Benson Hotel for Xavier Bowser back then, 40 Ooh. years, Swiss chef, you know, just just did it a certain cool. way, right? And the Benson was a Western hotel back then. And I'll never forget, there was all this buzz. What's this restaurant Zephyro all about? So the chef's like, let's go, let's go. So the yeah. direct, director of restaurants, executive chef, and myself, I was wow. the manager of the London Grill, uh, we go and it, and it blew our minds. Yeah. There were the, 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 the lettuces and the vegetables were yeah. so fresh. He, <laughs> I think Xavier stormed out of there so he could get back to the, back to the hotel and call of his, all of his vendors and, and start screaming at them because he <laughs> wanted <laughs> that, he wanted that produce that yeah. Bruce was, was starting to bring to the city of Port. I want to say that was, you know, maybe 98, 99, ah. really, really. And then he had a, he had a beautiful 10 year run there. And then of course, uh, um, you know, the rest is history with Bruce, but yeah, I just, boy, I love reminiscing. I just, I love thinking about the Northwest. So let's get back to, let's get back to, so what a career, right? So military college, uh, it, like I said, at the beginning, um, teacher, consultant, chef, so on and so forth. Um, did you, did you, and I, and I asked this question for, you know, the students that will be listening who are trying to figure it out yeah. for themselves, right? Do I become an entrepreneur? Do I go to Europe? What, what do I do with this passion I have? Did you know, Gene, you exactly what you wanted to do with your, your entry into the industry. Did you, did yeah. you know that path was teaching always no. going to be a piece of it? No, no, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I thought it would be like, Hey, I'm on the verge of retirement. So now I go and teach, right. I, I do. And then eventually I teach and granted I did, I was out in the industry for a long time, but worked for, you know, a couple of certified master chefs, but I'd say what was the hallmark sort of um, influence you know, we all should seek out a mentor, right? And and even at the high school level, I try to get students connected with local industry professionals that can serve not only to, to coach them and guide them in developing their skills, but to be that career coach and mentor. I had a chef, I worked at a, a YMCA camp in the San Juan Islands, right? Off the coast of of Washington. Ah, love, Beautiful. love Beautiful. going up there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and I was, I, I had gotten fired from Burger King. Okay. And, and, um, and so I got let go after three years, I got into a little skirmish. No, no judging, no judging. Yeah. Yep. And, and I know it was right. I was time. They, they made the right decision. And, but my brother was working up there. And so I went up and started uh, cooking and, and uh, he hooked me up, drove up to San Juan, started cooking. And this chef who had been a Marriott guy his whole career, you know, landed in retirement and landed at this YMCA camp in the San Juans as a way to sort of transition to full retirement. And, and he, uh, he requested a catalog, uh, you know, a culinary school catalog for me and handed it to me. And, and, um, and that was the beginning of, wait, culinary school? Wait, what? And, and I knew that I loved, even the flame broiler, I loved it, right? I loved the smell. Yeah, yeah, I loved yeah. It. Yeah. The admission of, of, of that, that Maillard reaction taking place. And was and, this before that, the military? This, yeah, this, yeah. This is okay. Before school, even. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. And, and, Got it. And, and the, you know, food is food, quick service, full service, fine dining. You know, I, there's so many pathways. And so I was sort of diversifying a little bit, but the chef said, Hey, you really got to go into culinary school. And, but he gave me this catalog and, and chef, I looked I read this catalog from front to back, had to have been a thousand times. When I was in the <laughs> army, all I was do was, dr I was dreaming. I'd sit in the barracks and I'd look at the catalog and I'd read the course description, not even knowing how to pronounce Garde Manger. What is that, <laughs> right? You know, Garde Mange, I, I had no idea what the vernacular was, but I wanted it. And so knew that I wanted to be in this industry just from those sort of two uh, career trajectories when I was in high school, um, had the mentor that influenced me to, to take the plunge, knew how I was going to fund it with the GI Bill, 
teaching and, you know, then I worked for a couple of certified master chefs, you know, Ron DeSantis, we were talking David Kellaway, great. Um, you know, there's only what, 50 or so, 60 or so CMCs in the nation and had the privilege of working after um, my time at CIA with Ron DeSantis, which he molded me. Um, the discipline, the, the care, the craft, but then he showed me how to teach that to others. And I didn't think at that point, the switch didn't come on, hey, I'm gonna get into education. But, but Chef DeSantis oh, left a mark on me um, that was whole, that was, that, was, um, that was preparing me and I didn't know it at the time. And, and he was a chef, mentor, uh, educator, extraordinaire, and, and still is. And, and, um, but, and even some discipline, has a Marine background, I'm Army. You know, we had some run-ins when, <laughs> when the, uh, the pride of this culinarian sort of came in conflict with him. He let me know where the boundaries were. And, and so then that influence of a teacher um, was imprinted on me. And then I went to WSU thinking I was going to get in and get out. Um, did my bachelor's in two years, my master's in one year. But while I was doing my master's, um, uh, the director there, Terry Umbright, said, hey, do you want to teach? And I was like, whoa, whoa, hold on. I mean, that's supposed to happen like in 30 years, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but then and it took some time, right, because you struggle in the classroom with are you going to be the chef or are you going to be that uh, nurturing educator, you know. And for the first couple of years, my evals were horrible. Kirk, my my student feedback, I was broken because I was just this tyrant sort of chef, push, push, push. I need the food in the window. We were running a student operated restaurant. It was just all about results, uh, getting them ready for industry. Then I noticed, wait, I'm supposed to serve them just like I do in the industry. I'm supposed mentor, to care for them. mentor Nurse, them. Mentor, yeah. coach, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, lean in and, and find out what those barriers are to their success and help them overcome those barriers. You know, and you, I mean, you influenced me in that regard too. You know, once we worked together um, with the whole Kitchen Academy transformation into Le Cordon Bleu in Seattle and opening that whole gig up, but you, you made me notice that, hey, it's about caring for the student. It's about every one of them being counted. And, and when one's not there, what are we going to do to help them engage and, and receive the best education possible, you know? Um, and so I got into education um, not knowing that I was going to stay, but you know, this is right. Another career path. If you get some good footing in the industry and build some experience, get some mentors, get some education, then it's like, Hey, maybe I will go teach. And, and, um, I, I would encourage students to even consider it as a long-term trajectory, you know, and, um, I, I wouldn't, uh, have traded it for the world. Um, love that I've been in academia as long as I have. Yeah, yeah, and a great career. And, and, and I love the comments about serving your students. A, a very wise man not too long ago said to me, we were talking more about business, right? And he said that one of the keys to being successful in business is liking your customers. And in many ways, your students are your customers, right? So it really yeah, helps yeah. if you like them, right? Yeah, yeah. Just just meet them halfway type of thing. Meet them yeah. in the middle. Um, so so today, right in COVID, in this time, this is the time that we have to care oh, for them because there's 100%. so many challenges on the outside right now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Love that. And love, love the chat about chef Ron DeSantis. Ironically enough, you can't even make this up, right? So Ron and his, and his wonderful wife, Sylvia were here yeah. visiting me at the school um, last Wednesday, last ah. Wednesday. And then they, and, uh, and, you know, we're in Boulder here, so we're about, we're about two hours, two and a half hours from the mountains where my, where my family has a, a, you know, a small hotel. And so Ron just spent the last five days with my, with my sister and, ah. and her family up in the mountains. They, he oh, sent my. all these videos, they, they hiked everywhere. They, and, and they just flew back to Connecticut uh, last night. So <laughs> let me, let me ask, because you, I, I love the conversation about education and how it's connected to mentoring young culinarians, would you consider yourself, uh, um, and, and, and it can be all of the above, Gene, would you consider yourself an educator first, a chef first? And I know you do a ton of work in the consulting sort of space or a business person first, or, or are, you, are you on the podium all at the same yeah. time? Yeah, I guess I'm, you know, I can't be all you said, so I can't choose, <laughs> I can't choose the letter D. 
it's got to be A, B, or C. I'd say I pivot, and it's it's A in this moment, it's B in this moment, and and it's C in this moment. I I would say the educator mentor type. I owe it to to these young students to to be nurturing and to be caring and to be bringing them on. But I also, you you know, my personal chefing during the summers, it keeps me relevant. I mean, I'm burning. I, all right, so I, I'm gonna share. Right, I. I made the mistake. I always tell students closed toed shoes, slip resistant, everything. But I'm I'm personal chefing on the Willamette River. It's 92. It's an outdoor kitchen area that's, you know, a quarter of a million dollar outdoor cooking area, wood fired oven, 36 inch grill. You know, please tell me you're not in flip flops. Please yeah, tell me you're not in flip flops. Oh. Yeah. And and I, but I'm like, man, but everybody's in flip flops, you know, and so I'm yeah. just being leisure with everybody else. And, and uh, quickly reinforce the lesson that I teach in the classroom, why we don't wear flip-flops in the kitchen. It just, you know, just some hot water on my foot, not a big deal, but it, it was, uh, it was my son, 13 years, always goes, very often goes with me and cooks with me. And he's not going to be in this business necessarily, but he loves just hanging out with me and cooking. And sure. he's like, don't you yeah. teach your students yeah. not to wear flip-flops in the kitchen? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I do, buddy. Yeah. 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 So the so, lesson that so, day was karma, right? Little, yeah, little right. Bit, and yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a little bit of a little bit of all of them, uh, Kirk. You know, I, I I think it at different times it calls for a different um, different aptitude or different uh, measure of of where I'm coming from, my lens. But I, I would say um, I, I do hope that I'm I'm constantly patient enough to be that teacher. Uh, I'd say it's probably the the um, the center of the wheel you know, and then I work from there. So now yeah, that's, that, that, that's a great response. So let, let's stay with the business piece just for a bit. I, 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 I love the connection of your love for education and sort of the building of, of culinary schools, right? So not a lot of people get to do something that cool, building a culinary school, and you've done yeah. it a couple of times now. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about what you learned what, what you might even do different today, um, right. having gone through that a couple of times. You're going you're gonna to remember this one. Do you remember when I called you from Seattle and I said, hey, chef, they didn't put any, they didn't put any. No floor, floor drains, no floor drains, drains, drains. in the yeah, building. Yeah. And, and, and the, you know, and the person said, <laughs> oh yeah, there are. And I was like, hey, I'm on the ground here in Seattle and there are no floor drains. There were only a, hand, a couple floor sinks. For I'm looking at the drinks. blueprint and I could yep. see it, but you're like, oh, there's no, They're not there's there. no you floor know, drain. And, and yeah. So yeah. I would, I would say that the hallmark of what I've learned in consulting, and I've, I've had a number of community colleges that I've worked with and, um, and, and it's been always a privilege, but it's all about, um, I find that often we have consultants that don't understand how to teach come into these projects. And that's, that can be a challenge because they don't understand the student learning experience. They don't understand the flow. They don't understand the importance of, of a clear line of sight for good communication. They don't under, understand the, the distribution of equipment and how mm -hmm. sometimes if you, if you ask all the students, you know, 20 students in the kitchen to be on one deep fat fryer that, that competence, competency is not going to get done in this class period, you know? And so, um, so I think that design um, needs to, that whole form to function. Um, I try to bring in the educator hat and say, hey, this is how students learn. Let's think about it from a pedagogy perspective. How do they learn? How, do, how, do, how does the teacher leverage technology and teach? And then how do we effectively design the layout in a way that's going to ensure the students have the best quality learning experience? So I have found most of the time, if I get into a space that's already, I walked into one, um, even, even the opening with you, you know, it was already sort of cookie cuttered and done. And then you go, ah, these are the things I would have changed, you know, um, and, and try to learn from those two. But getting in on the really front end of design and even really, I think, um, listening to, I did with a, um, Truckee Meadows Community College in, 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 um, uh, in Nevada, I worked with them and, and we did a whole, we just brought all the industry people in and, and just spent an evening listening, you know, not talking, not sure. telling them what we yeah. do, uh, but saying local industry, because there is this nuance, there's stuff that's going on in Portland and Vancouver that's different than going on in Denver and Boulder. And so you got to listen to your industry people too doing that needs assessment on the front end and saying, hey, what do you need? And just at least on the front end of design, 
um, listening to those local industry professionals is key too. But always having the student in mind through the process is so important. Yeah, it was always a, um, first of all, exciting, exhilarating process, you know, designing kitchens, uh, particularly for, for new culinary students. But the marketing piece, the, the show piece part is always part of it as well, right? It's got to be that, uh, you know, that beautiful space that gets people excited about being there. And so to, to combine that or balance that with being super practical, appropriate, and let's say in industry relevant, right, is, is, is no easy task. While we're on that subject, um, let's go into the weeds a little bit. Uh, even tougher is developing curriculum. And you, you told me once you kind of back into it, right? You, it, it's important to know what the outcomes are and then build your pedagogy around that, right? But yeah. walk, walk us through, you, you know, the fun part of developing curriculum. Well, you know, I think it's, uh, I think probably the underpinning of that is being collaborative. Like if you have a faculty already on the ground, um, it's about having a conversation with them it's also about, I think about, you know, when I was um, working at the Art Institute in Portland, having Corey Schreiber, you know, and, and uh, Eric Weinkoop, right, on, on the team with <laughs> oh, me, yeah. you know, I mean, just two just awesome, you know, uh, food loving chefs, educators, I mean, ed Eric educated, you know, anthropological perspective of food all the time. I love working with faculty. So I think, um, I think when you think about curriculum, I even think about, you know, doing work with Glenn Mack, you know, back in, in when he was at, at uh, Brightwater, you know, and, and I think about how do we tap uh, the assets that we have on the ground. So, uh, you, like you said, one of the things is a great facility. Another thing is a great faculty. And, and so then being able to have that conversation, um, how do you uh, hire the right faculty if, if it's a new open um, and, and groom people for, for such a position um, if, it's, if it's not an existing program. But if it's an existing program, how do you capitalize on that asset? And so I would say um, faculty input into the curriculum um, is, is super important uh, because again, it's lending itself to a listening ear. It's not just saying I'm coming in as a consultant. I, I, you know, we've seen so many consultants that come in and know it all, you know, and, and I mean, we've all lived in a world that that's what consultants are hired to do, to know it all. But I think consultants also are facilitators um, and, and, and listeners, and then they, and then they collate that in a way and package it. And in this, in this way, you shape a curriculum and, and you look at the Corey Shrivers from back in the day, Wildwood restaurant, you say, okay, we have got to play up sustainability in our student operated restaurant. Love putting Chef Schreiber in the restaurant because you knew that passion play was going to just transform the student learning experience. So, so I think that's the other, that's another part of designing curriculum is, is leveraging that asset. Oh, uh, so many, so many great thoughts there. I, I love the comments uh, about faculty, right? You're, you're making no enemies by supporting your faculty, right? Super, super important. Uh, by the way, Wine Coop, Eric was my, first assistant when I was teaching in Portland way back in the day. And wow. who, whoever would have known that Eric would, would move on to become a Fulbright uh, scholar. And uh, he's also a duck, by the way. Don't ever forget I know, that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of more involved with international language and such when he was in, in college. And then he just fell in love with food. And, and he's, uh, you know, he's still doing that. You know, one thing I just wanted to point out, you, you mentioned the word collaboration, which I think is so important. I was reading an article the, the other day by someone in Tim Brown's organization, right? IDEO, all about design thinking. And, uh -huh. and, and I thought it was so brilliant because they were talking, they were talking about their coworkers, their colleagues, and they referred to them as uh, collaborators rather than employees or even team members, they were collaborators. I thought it was brilliant. Really, 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 really good. So let's, let's, um, let's speed up a little bit. You, you, you know, you've talk, taught at several universities, uh, been in operations uh, with another large university. Now you're teaching at the high school level. Can you speak a little bit to the difference that you see anyway between your typical college student and your high school student? Now, a college student in a culinary program has in many ways made that decision, right? Yeah. This is my path. 
I'm going to pay attention. In high school, it may not be as easy, right? Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I, I think that the 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 message I'd have for both audiences, high school and college student, um, and, and even a high school teacher would be, you know, getting them connected with industry as soon as possible is is number one, right? Good advice. I mean, yeah. let's 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 see if they can stage somewhere. Let's see if they can get employment. And right now, right, there's no lack of opportunities for employment, you know, post COVID. There is everybody has uh, either a bonus option after three months or six months, or, you know, there's so much of that rolling out. So no lack of opportunity. Many of the restaurants around us still here are not open full throttle, you know, six days a week. They're still only open five days. And so um, just because they, they they're, they're struggling getting workforce. So I think that's number one, getting them connected and trying to get them out there a little bit, because, you know, it takes a little bit of crazy to work in this business. And, I would hate for students to, to get through high school and determine, hey, I'm going to change direction is one thing. You know, getting through college and then changing direction, I, I want the student to come into education saying, I know, sort of like me, I knew I'm spending the GI Bill on culinary school. No question, no doubt about it. That's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. because I got burned a little bit, I cleaned a, a grease trap and, and I, I, I knew the ins and outs and knew that I still loved it. I, you know, I love the instant gratification of providing great food for people and getting that feedback and going, man, the adrenaline of, of somebody giving me feedback about a plate of food. Um, even, even in my days at, you know, I mean, I mean, I worked in high school, I worked at Sizzler, but it was the first sort of a la carte situation, you know, but I, but I, it was cool. I mean, working with lobster and steak and, 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 um, and so, so I think getting into the industry is 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 important for all. The, the sooner the better. Um, know that the, reinforce the idea that you want it. Don't let the Food Network be your sole decision maker, right? Um, for the high school students, it's ex, it's exploratory. Like I don't know if I like this. I'm building life skills. I know I'm going to cook every day. This is giving me those skills. That's that's phenomenal. Great way to approach it. But then to keep an open mind that hey. I love serving people. I always say, whether you want to be in the kitchen in front of the house, hotel, you know, in the lodging space, travel tours and whatever, the, all of the one thing we have in common is we love serving people. So if you love making something right for somebody else or, or, or going, going that extra mile to do that service recovery, if something didn't go right, what are you going to do about it? You know? And so, so I, I think that if you have that wiring, and you discover that, then you know, oh, wow, this might be the space for me. And, and you know what, the living wage thing, hey, you get in, you get some experience, and you're going to find your way to living wage very quickly in this industry. You're going to find your way into management. You're going to find your way into a career path that you can get into the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. You're not, you're not the $15 an hour forever. So that's a way to get in and know, hey, I always say that burning is learning, right? So you got to get in, get burned a little bit um, and know, hey, this is, I like it. I dig serving people. I love preparing great food if if, if culinary is what you're choosing. And then at that point, then it's about, hey, where do I want to go to school? I'm looking. Who's my mentor? I'm looking. What, um, you know, American Culinary Federation uh, certification am I I looking at? Certified culinarian, number one. You know, I'm going to go after that. So, so and then establishing those goals. And, and I'd say that's prudent for both high school and college. But then you got the one that I think about the, the period of time last year when I was teaching online just as adjunct at a Scott VA. I think about the career changer. Then you got that student, right? Sure. And it's different, the different story for them. Because I, I always was so invigorated by the student who was changing careers and, and noticed, I wish I had done this my whole life, you know, and, and, um, Passion and, comes and, through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it did. Yeah. And in their projects, their capstone projects and different classes that I would teach, um, with the Scott faculty, it was seeing those career changers, they would put their all into it because that was all they had. They had nothing to lose. And, and I would, I would just encourage the high school student or the college level, you know, engage, you know, stay at the table. Um, you know, do those, do those competencies and give it your best. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned pathways, um, before we get too far, I, I wanted to come back to that group groups like pro start skills, USA, FCCLA, 
Um, are, are these also super, super important in your, in your environment? Yeah, I, I think they enrich the experience for the student. Now, granted, you know, having judged at Nationals for Pro Start for like 12 years and, and back in the days of Bill Nolan and, and you know, and, and then that Pro Start has taken on sort of different, a different feel and, and the curriculum has been revised and um, Skills USA having led competitions in Skills USA. Again, both of those competitions is just about um, students um, understanding competencies, you know, and sure, building confidence. Yeah. The, the challenge with the competitions, even ACF sanctioned competitions, is that very few students really get to participate. But I think that schools, um, high school and, and uh, post-secondary, we want to create an opportunity where students can excel. And I think that all those um, competitive uh, pathways are ways, for me, I formulated my food um, philosophy around my days competing, you know, and I yeah. remember the day that I finally got a gold medal, you know, from Fon Franz Paparol or, or, you know, having <laughs> Bowen Hennon and different chefs coming through uh, the Pacific Northwest and judging. I'd be competing in Portland and in Spokane, and, and I'd just go wherever I could to compete um, during this phase when I was at WSU. But it, it uh, solidified in me what I believed about food, you know, and, and, um, and that was the first time that I really understood why I do what I do with food, you know, and, and that, that was where I finally said, okay, maybe, maybe you can call me chef, maybe, maybe now, you know, because I feel like I understand more now than I ever have before. Um, I, I didn't like that title coming too early, you know, and, but um, you got to understand uh, that, that science and, and um, the, the sourcing and, and the relationship of how that connects those flavors work together, coming to the plate and, and, and tying them with the guest experience. So, so I think all those are important. Um, and I, I think that we want to give students those opportunities still here now and today, for sure. I love it. And, and I love the humility, by the way. Um, you've earned the chef title, buddy. You, you, you've <laughs> earned it. By the way, you'll get a kick out of this. I, I talked to Bill Nolan yesterday. Uh, <laughs> so many great memories, right? Um, yeah. Hey, let's talk just a little bit about, um, you know, COVID and, 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 and what went on in terms of teaching. How, how did you find yourself having to pivot uh, at Battleground to, to really continue yeah. to impact students? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, COVID has changed everything. You know, the, the one thing that I'm a believer in with, with schools is having a good rigorous curriculum that's already housed in the learning management system, whether it be, you know, Moodle or whatever. And, and so I, I had everything tooled out in Google Classroom. So when COVID hit, the pivot was quick. Whereas I had a lot of colleagues that were like, what? You want me to move my content online? I've been teaching for 20 or 30 years and I hand them the paper and they do the paper and I close the paper. And so I think it forced us on the technological side to, to adapt. Um, sure. and, yeah. and, yeah. and it sort of leveled the playing field. It, it, it forced, uh, um, a Chromebook into every hand in K through 12, you know, whereas, you know, the year before last, I always had to worry about, you know, when does this group get their Chromebooks? Oh, next year, you know? And so, um, so it leveled the playing field in terms of technology and access to, to content. Um, you know, it was tough teaching from home. I do demos, you know, I built out the YouTube page and, You've seen a little bit of that, a little bit of me doing that. And, and, um, and it was fun. Um, you you got to bring the enthusiasm. You got to bring it like in yeah, stereo. Oh, oh yeah, you because, do. You do. Because you, you lose them in the medium. So bringing that enthusiasm, I'd even have my kids in the videos. My own kids would be my students. And one of them would be like trying to go to sleep. And, and another <laughs> kid would be asking questions. So my three children would be, would be my students. And so, I think in just trying to stay engaged, um, you know, maintaining relationships with parents, um, trying to find the student that's not at the table again. How do we how do we get them um, to to stay in the learning experience? The, pan so the pandemic really. Um, I, I I don't want to lose sight of the the family piece. The pandemic and so much engagement on Zoom really made the family kind of welcome the family, yeah. you know, the, the pets, the cat that crawls across your shoulder. Right. <laughs> I mean, people are so, so accepting of that. It's almost the norm now. Right. You know, yeah. it's like, Oh, sorry, my dog's barking. You know, he wants to go out. Well, let's stop the meeting for a minute and let your dog out. It's okay. Yeah. It's totally okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you spent, um, 
I, I, I don't want to lose sight of the, uh, the importance of being able to pivot. And you mentioned, you know, having an LMS ready to go and that, that helped you a little bit. Um, when you spent some time helping us at Escoffier as well, you, you felt really comfortable in that online environment, right? Yeah. But I will say that, um, one of the things I learned when I was, when I was with you and it was just in a part-time capacity during COVID really, right. When COVID took off, I was you know, actually, you know, I think it was the fall before I came in and, and, um, and then COVID hit. And I think that more than anything, um, I became more empathetic to the learner um, oh, and, yes. and yes. you know, trying to understand where they're at because everybody's world was upside down, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then I think that assessment, um, I changed how I assess at the high school level online. I changed it entirely based on what I did at Escoffier because I learned how do I, how do I capture you know, without tasting the food, but how do I capture every element of what they did? And so I have what I call a SLAT and, and a student learning assessment template. And that's where they upload their pictures and their reflection. And so it's just a, a Google slide, you know, deck that they get individually in Google Classroom and they upload the pictures. And so I'm not changing that methodology, actually. We're going back live tomorrow in school, <laughs> battleground, you're back. And, and, and we're going back live and, and I'm still staying with that. Um, they'll be doing it as a team now, team-based learning, um, TBL, but at the same time, still producing evidence of what they did and what they learned. And, and I think that if students can articulate to me as a teacher, if I can tell you what I learned, when I burned this, I learned that I walked away to the restroom. The heat was too high. I, I lost touch with the heat regulation. I didn't do effective communication with my classmate. They walked away. It burned. You being able to articulate to me why it burned is way more important than that it burned. I, I, could, I could really care less so long as there's no significant fires happening. Um, <laughs> I, I, the evidence of learning is what I care about as a teacher. And so I think I, think I saw at Escoffier a way to, to assess and, and have the students reflect more critically and, and articulate that. And then I just took that back and, and said, okay, how am I gonna have these students do the same thing? And, and it's, it's, I think it's been richer. And when I see student learning assessment templates that they go over, they do videos and they have their family at the table and, and their dog. It's beautiful. Like said, is it's, walking it's, up. I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, sign me up. I mean, when the student shares their learning with their community, their family, their, their guardians, whatever the situation is, um, that's, that's super. It's, it's a beautiful and, thing. And I, I love the, you know, the, the cognitive experience that we put in front of our students, right? It's like, learn the language of food. The narrative is important. It's yeah. very, very important. I, I, I love that explanation. Well, we could, we could go on forever, Gina. We can, um, we're getting to the end of our time. You know that the podcast is the ultimate dish. Yeah. So before we say goodbye, what is the ultimate dish? Yeah. Okay. So I gave this some thought, you know, I would say the ultimate dish for me is very situational. Um, I, it's very in the moment and, and um, it ebbs and it flows. And I, I would say if I was to, to do anything that I love to do about cooking, um, it's about just going to the local market. And, and designing the ultimate dish from, as you said at the beginning, the bounty. What is, you know, I think about these little Kimberly Eastern Oregon strawberries when they start popping up in the early part of the season. And I know that I can grill some, you know, some angel food cake. And, and I know that just a little bit of strawberry sorbet and do like a little trio or whatever. And it's so simple. And the strawberries are just like candy, even, or doing a, a panzanella um, you know, grilled bread salad with you the, love your bread salad. You yeah, love your bread salad. <laughs> that are right here. They're like sugar when they're in season, you yeah, know. And, yeah. Um, so I think um it's situational and and it's about who I'm with. Um, I think about even a meal I had, you know, Glenn Mack and and Kamiko over, you know, a, a few months back and and just just had some halibut, you know, watchitong, you know, getting a little little international flavor profile in there with the vinaigrette and and just searing that off and just to done this, um, you know, in a cast iron pan, I, I'm looking forward to my, my love for cooking is I got, a, I told you, I got a new cooktop coming, man. I got this new induction burner coming. that's getting installed on Thursday at home. And I'm, I'm looking forward to taking just simple food 
Um, it, it's sort of like the, uh, you know, you heard the, the Andre Saltner of, of the day or the Jacques Pepin. It's just about repetition and it's about good ingredients and, and a little bit of application of heat and seasoning and, and, and serving it. So, um, but I will say this, man, we're going into fall. I love me a braised, um, using a Pinot from Oregon, a braised short rib with some polenta, a little bit of truffle oil on that. If I was to choose a dish that's hearty and warm and cozy, that's gonna be needed in about two months from now, I'd probably be there, you know, um, grass-fed beef, just thick short ribs. Um, that would be probably where I'm living in a couple you're months. You're bringing me yeah. to the Northwest, buddy. You're bringing yeah. me to the Northwest. I, yeah. I absolutely love it. No, no doubt that you were going to have a beautiful response like that. Gene, thank you so much for spending some time. We'll have you back. We'll talk more maybe in another season. Good luck with uh, Battleground opening up tomorrow, Woo! buddy. Go Tigers, right? Thanks, yeah. Gene. Be good, man. Thanks. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.